So in May of last year, uh, the San Antonio Fire Department responded to a single alarm fire, which was eventually upgraded to a two alarm fire, um, at a strip mall, single story strip mall, we've all seen them. Uh, there was a fire in a fitness center, gym facility. Um, the initial crews arrived, I think it was about 13 companies initially arrived at the scene. Um, engine 35 and ladder 35 were two of the first ones there. Engine 35 went in on attack. Ladder 35 was doing the primary search and rescue. Um, engine 35 gets in there with the hose, can't move. And they're in a fitness center. You can imagine all the equipment in there. The hose is very restricted. Um, their thermal imaging camera went out, right? It wasn't working, it was just a whiteout. It's not an uncommon situation. Um, so ladder 35 is doing this primary search and rescue, advances beyond the fire hose, the initial attack. That's sort of called freelancing um, in the firefighting world. Typically, you like to stay behind that hose, so if nothing else, you have a, a, a tether to get back out of the building. But they advanced uh, beyond the hose, and um, pretty soon afterwards, they got a mayday, the first mayday call. So everybody's ordered out for a PAR, the personnel accountability um, order. They're all out. Um, and immediately three crews are asked to uh, do the rescue intervention team because at that point they realized they knew, they knew they were missing firefighters, but they didn't know how many, they didn't know who they were, and they didn't know where they were. Okay? So the, the writs go in trying to find their downed firefighters, um, and then eventually they learn uh, minutes late. You know, what's amazing is how quickly this all happens, right? At, you know, 21, 28, 16, May Day. Right after that, the PAR, a minute later, teams are going in to do the writ. Another five minutes later, um, they learned that actually they know they have two firefighters missing. Okay, and then soon after that, um, they, they brought out one of the firefighters. It was the one who called Mayday, but they still didn't know who the other firefighter was and where, where he was. Um, so three more crews are sent in to do a rescue. Again, the cameras go out. Um, at this point, they didn't have dedicated RIT teams, so they're getting really low on air. Everyone's ordered to exit the structure. Um, they do another accountability. They learn they're still missing one firefighter. In fact, one of the folks who went in to do the rescue had to be rescued himself. All right, you send a lot of firefighters in, the risk just sort of grows exponentially. So long story short, eventually the interior of the building was just no longer viable. It was burning too hot, too fast. It was too dangerous. Um, Two hours later, after the initial May Day, they find the downed firefighter, and of course, um, he was pronounced dead at the scene. And, and then really, unfortunately, the cause of this fire was arson. So every year, firefighters are, they die or they are seriously injured because they are lost or disoriented inside of buildings. Or maybe they've been injured and they cannot be found. Every day, law enforcement goes into buildings and their precise whereabouts are unknown. This is really, this ability to, to, to locate and track firefighters, especially indoors, it's, it's a real holy grail for public safety. So in our group, uh, Public Safety Communications Research, we're in the middle of a, a really aggressive $300 million R&D program that's closely associated with the development of the uh, FirstNet network, which Jeff Bratcher was here yesterday. Maybe he mentioned some of the work we're doing in our connections. But in the same legislation that authorized the creation of that network, they also um, appropriated money for, for NIST to advance some key technologies that could take advantage of this new broadband network. Two of them were really just sort of handed to us in the legislation. That was making sure that Mission Critical Voice migrated from their land mobile radio networks over to this new broadband network, and also that there was the ability to interface between this new broadband network and the existing land mobile radio networks. But then through a really rigorous stakeholder engagement process, we identified some other areas where we felt our money could make the biggest impact. Those other areas were public safety analytics, and we're really focusing there on you know, multimedia fusion uh, and real-time information. Um, also, user interfaces, so new ways to interact with this, all this data they're about to get and the new types of devices they're going to get and really focusing on that user experience. Then the other area we identified that was identified was location-based services. 
And within that area, we're focusing on a key, few key technologies. What this map here shows you um, is just kind of the, some of the breadth of the engagement we're doing. We've, uh, to this point, we've put out a lot of uh, research grants and done a lot of price challenges. You can see this is a worldwide effort. All of these dots represent you know, companies or universities, institutions, or public safety organizations that are being funded by us to do research in these areas. And if Paul goes up to the filter, uh, the top left there, of this map, uh, there we go. Um, we can select uh, location-based services and we can see kind of just the breadth of the work that's going on just within that portfolio. And again, you see it's worldwide. We've got things going on in Melbourne, Florida, Melbourne, Australia, China, uh, England, all over the place. Um, so it's a really exciting effort, um, a lot of energy, a lot of new, uh, you know, part, part of the thing we're doing with these funds is really trying to build a new public safety R&D ecosystem. So a lot of these folks are just new to public safety in general. So it's a lot of bringing a lot of new energy and ideas and innovation to the mix. Um, I think we'll go on to the next slide. So what I'd like to do is kind of is use, is talk about the, the areas that we're investigating in location-based services and specifically related to indoor mapping, indoor tracking, and indoor navigation, and kind of relate them back to that incident in San, San Antonio. So one of the things that was, uh, as they go through the, you know, you read through the fatality reports done by the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, or NIOSH, they have a great firefighter uh, fatality program that goes and does post-incident reporting. Um, they discover they didn't have a pre-plan for this particular facility. Why didn't they have a pre-plan? Well, it's very difficult to do for the, for the first, first thing. It's very time consuming, very complicated. There's tons of square miles that each of these jurisdictions is responsible for. Okay, well, what if there was a better way to, to, do, to do these pre-plans? I mean, if they had a pre-plan, they might have discovered some things right off the bat, which is the way, you know, the, the front and rear door, and there was an interior door that they didn't know about, and they would have seen a lot of the clutter inside the fitness center. You know, then, then who, do, where, who do you send in and where? Uh, very risky proposition. So something that, that we're focusing on is the use of um, LIDAR and 360 degree imagery to go into spaces and capture 3D images and models of, of places, of uh, structures in real time. So what Jared here is modeling for us, and I mentioned to Jared, this could be a, a start of a very um, <laughs> fruitful, mobile modeling career. He's a good looking guy. I mean, this could be something for him. Um, this is an indoor, this is a mobile mapping system. And what you see here is, is a LIDAR or a light detection and ranging system spinning around. It's got 32 laser beams, this one. So yes, we are shooting you with laser beams right now. And then there's a, a 360 degree camera on top. So here's the deal. To do indoor location tracking, you need indoor maps, right? So indoor maps are very difficult to get. Uh, a lot of times when they do these pre-plans, you know, they're handwritten reports, they might draw a little sketch. Uh, very rarely do they actually have a floor plan of a facility, much less all the other information that you need about a, a structure. So they're difficult to get. First responders are already walking through a lot of these facilities as part of their pre-incident or pre-planning operations, so why not give them a way to capture this information in real time and then do a whole lot more? Um, so what Jared, we can see right here, I'll just kind of try to show you um, if you kind of walk around maybe a little bit, I'll move this. Someone in the front row can see it, but what's happening right now is he's collecting information about this space. And you can see about 75 to 100 meters reliably. And as you walk through a structure like the Memorial Center, you can map the whole building and have a 3D model when you walk out. But the coolest thing about this is that that's just the start of what you can get. Here's an example in the top left corner of uh, the floor of one of our buildings uh, where I work. Um, you can see it's pretty darn detailed. There's a lab there, a bunch of cubicles. That's just one floor. If you look on the top right here, you can see a 3D image of this whole building. And there's a yellow trace there. It's probably too hard to see. You can probably bring the lights down maybe to help see that. Um, there's a yellow trace there. It shows you exactly where you walked. On the bottom left here, you can see a 2D cut of a floor plan. It's not as precise as you'd get from like a CAD model or something like that, but it's pretty darn good, right? Um, and then something that's really cool on the bottom right here is, is change detection. Okay, so let's say you had a floor plan, you got it, you got it once, what are the odds you're gonna get another floor plan when the, uh, the building owner does a remodel, right? Pretty slim. So what this allows you to do is every time you go back into a space, you're updating, you're getting real-time information about that space. 
And so this, this change detection feature, you can load up your reference map. When you revisit the facility, you will immediately see what is different. What's that wall? What's that new piece of equipment that you've got that could be a real big hazard that, that uh, the fire department needs to know about? Um, so those are just some of the really interesting things you can do sort of after you get this, this data. Thank you, Jared, for coming up here. Give a big hand to Jared. <laughs> Um, but there's a lot of other really cool things you can do as well, right? You've got this model. What if you load that up into your VR system and you train? You do immersive training in the very same environment you might find yourself in. You could attach an LTE phone onto this and capture the signal strength of your, you know, first net, let's say, walking through these buildings. Um, you could do, you know, you've got a 3D model, which you could hand to people who could look at the, the flow, flow path, flow dynamics through a building, very important to firefighters. So there's all kinds of value added um, things that you can do with this data, and that's one of the big points. So we kind of call this the future of pre-planning. Um, so a couple other, oh, and one very important thing I didn't mention, um, automated object detection. You're going through uh, this building, you've got a camera. You know, the image, the object classification is going crazy with, you know, Facebook and Amazon and Google. They're all doing it, right? So you don't have to sit there. You shouldn't have to sit there and annotate that here's a standing water pipe or here's this utility panel. You've got a camera on there. You can classify it. You can recognize it. You can label it, and it should be on the map, geotagged, ready to go. Um, and you could label scenes as well. You get a collection of these objects that you pull together. Now you've got some scene semantics. You can say this is a lab. This is an office. This is a... Um, you know, there's oxygen tanks, this is a very hazardous space, things like that. So a lot we can do with this data, a very exciting space. All of this, uh, is, you know, the, depends on the continuing decrease in cost of LIDAR. Um, the automobile industry is dumping billions into this space because LIDAR is a key part of the autonomous vehicle uh, future. Um, so that's happening and that what they're really moving towards are solid state sensors, which is again going to really decrease the cost um, so a, a system like what Jared had on, a little pricey right now for a lot of departments, but we are seeing the cost of these 3D mobile mapping systems really decrease, and the amount of, the, the amount of things that people, the technologies people are adding to this space, it's incredible. Every day, if you read the, the trade journals, it's just something new, new ways to make things like object classification easier and easier. Very exciting. Of course, what we want to see for public safety, what we're driving towards is you come and get that data, you press the, the red button, the magic button, and everything just happens. Right? We're not there yet. There's a ways to go, but we are working towards that future. Okay, Paul, if we can go to the next slide. So the other thing we're really spending a lot of time on is indoor tracking, right? Going back to that incident. Despite, you know, if you read through these, these reports, there's so many things going on. These are such complex operations. You know, what's going on with the RIT team, the pre-plans, uh, all these SOPs, incredibly complex situations, and they, uh, these reports always have a ton of recommendations, but the bottom line is this. Even if they didn't do all of that stuff, like maybe they, they thought they should, they were supposed to, or they were being recommended to do, um, if they had the ability to track the first responders indoors, nobody would have died, most likely, okay? But, and ironically, these reports typically don't mention as a recommendation, you know, let's develop an indoor tracking capability, because they really focus on what can be done right now. But we're spending a lot of time and energy and, and investing a lot of money in this space. So what we've got, for example, are universities who are developing ultimate navigation chips. The top left here, it's taking a bunch of different sensors and putting them in a three-dimensional chip. It allows you to develop much lower uh, cost single-dimensional sensors like gyroscopes and accelerometers. You package them in a 3D um, way, and you can combine this with a bunch of other different uh, signal types and sensors, and you, get, you develop this, you know, again, a low-cost navigational grade um, chip that could be inserted in a lot of different devices. Um, in the middle here, you see this boot um, with a prototype. This is not, this is just a test sort of unit. What this is, it's an inertial measurement unit. Again, it's got acceler accelerometers and gyroscopes in it. And the thing about, you know, if, if these inertial, you, by the way, these are all in your phones, right, in your back pocket. Um, so when you're, you know, you're walking through a building or outside, you can see your movement, right, in real time. Well, the problem with these sensors especially in these low-cost commercial ones, is they drift. It's called drift. They get off track very quickly. I mean, tens of meters in a matter of a minute. Okay? Now, if that technology um, worked, we'd be done. This would be a you know, game over, problem solved. Um, there are much higher quality inertial sensors, but you start to get up into 
you know, thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know, until we're on, on talking about things that are on rockets, you know, potentially millions of dollars. Um, so what we really want to try to do is get these inertial sensors down to a, a more of a commodity price point that are then what we could call navigation grade. And interestingly enough, one of the techniques that shows a lot of promise is that if you take these inertial sensors and you put them somewhere like a foot where it experiences a zero velocity moment, it's called a zero velocity update. As I'm walking, there's a point where my, my foot has, it's not moving, it's zero velocity. And you, if you can sense that, you can sort of recalibrate those inertial sensors and say, I'm at zero velocity. So that constrains this drift. So what this team is doing is looking at that uh, technique in a lot more detail and looking at different parts of the boot. Where does it work? And then again, firefighters are on their hands and knees most of the time inside a building. So how does it work when they're in those sort of mobility modes? How does it work when you're sliding downstairs? Things like that. Um, so very exciting. They're looking at LTE, for example. We talk about FirstNet. Uh, the accuracy in a, from a cellular network that you can get is not enough uh, for the requirements of first responders. However, it can be added to this sort of multi-sensor fusion solution to give you some constraints Again, and if it's everywhere, um, that's a big, that's a big, uh, big aid. What here you, you see here is just some, a track, you know, the true track in green, and then what they got with a combination of an inertial measurement unit and using LTE. You see, it's pretty darn good. So a lot of promise there. Um, we've got a group that's looking at something really neat using um, visual odometry is what it's called. So it's using a camera or visual sensor to actually track your movements. Okay, now, if for a law enforcement, that could work really well, just as is, especially with all the body cameras that are out there. In a fire, not so great, right? But what this group is doing is using, looking at thermal imaging cameras and using those to actually do this visual odometry. And so they're finding, and they're using a lot of machine learning approaches to sort of aid this. That's one thing you'll find in this, uh, just like any technology, machine learning has permeated everything. Um, so our groups are using that as well. Uh, so they've got a prototype here where they've mounted a, a, a 3D camera and they've got this on top of a thermal imaging camera and they're using the combination of this machine learning and the tick to basically study uh, what they can do um, inside a smoky environment. And what's really neat about this as well is they're also training their algorithms based on a, sort of a more of a constrained um, motion algorithm like right hand searches, left hand searches. They're the first people to do this. So when you can, again, when you constrain the solution a little more, uh, you start to get uh, more accuracy. So very unique. Um, and then we have some other groups. There are, a lot of groups are looking at ultra-wideband technologies. The reason I pulled this in here is ultra-wideband is very wide bandwidth. Doesn't, doesn't uh, because due to some uh, signal strength issues with the current licensing, uh, FCC licensing, it doesn't go that far. However, it shows a ton of, it's very accurate. And it shows a ton of promise from a cooperative ranging standpoint. So let's say that um, you know, they always go in in teams and there's a bunch of them in there. If you could, maybe I don't have a really good location at the moment, um, but my teammate does or this, you know, another unit over does, and I'm close enough in this building to actually get a good ultra wideband signal from them, we can, think we can cooperatively localize each other. So again, it's another constraint that helps narrow down where an individual is. So this, so this idea of doing cooperative localization it's not being done anywhere else, as far as we know, except in the, these applications. So what I want you to kind of take home from here is that, you know, there's a lot of work in indoor location tracking in different industries, healthcare, manufacturing, logistics, entertainment, um, you name, retail. <laughs> they want to know what aisle you're in, right, so they can flash you that, that sale. Um, but this use case is way harder than all of those. And so we are, for the first time, really, uh, as far as we know, spending a, a lot of time, energy, and money on really trying to solve this problem. And we've got a lot of very talented people working on it, a lot more work um, to come of this. Traditionally, the way that these things have worked is you, you deploy Wi-Fi or Bluetooth beacons um, in an environment, and you do what's called fingerprinting. It's very time intensive. You walk around, and you measure the signal strengths of all these locations, and then you kind of know where you are based on your proximity to a Bluetooth beacon or what all you're getting from all these different wireless access points. But that was not going to work for first responders, right? We need an infrastructure-free solution. They show up to the site. There's no power. There's no external requirements. You show up, and the thing just works, OK? So again, another real difficult part of this problem that we're trying to solve. Um, I guess we can go to the next slide. OK, so now we've, let's say we've, we've done all this work. We've invested all this um, time. How do we know this thing, these things work? Well, NIST is uh, very well known for its measurement science. 
um, capabilities. So something that we're focusing a lot on is, is measuring these indoor localization systems. So on our campus in Gaithersburg, we actually have five buildings that have precisely surveyed um, dots all over the floor. We call these control points. So we can take systems through there and, and have, we have a ground truth. And so as we go through with the localization system, we can measure where you are. Um, we're also adding, so these, these, these facilities represent like warehouses, uh, underground facility, a high rise, a typical sort of three-story office complex, a real range, because that's what you need, right? We're also adding, we have a, a really neat, neat facility on campus called the Net Zero Facility where they study energy savings in a typical home. We're adding that to our mix as well because residential is so important um, for this problem, especially for firefighters. Um, so one of the reasons you need this real diversity is that you know, within structure, structural fires, by far the highest number of fatalities occurs in residential properties, and that's because there are by far and away many more residential fires. However, the risks are far greater in commercial structures. If you look here, deaths per 100,000 fires, you know, manufacturing, public uh, assembly, stores, et cetera, et cetera, much, much higher. So we need to be able to measure these systems in a range of facilities, and we are, we are doing that. Okay, I think we can go to the next. So, we talked about indoor mapping, indoor tracking, now indoor navigation. What if they had been able to, you know, so you know you've got a down firefighter, now you've got to go find him or her, right? How do you do it? What's the best way to get through the building? What's the most efficient way? Um, that's still a problem in itself, right? So, indoor navigation. So, Denver has a great public transportation system. Hopefully, many of you uh, were able to take it from the airport to Boulder, right? Uh, if you flew, anybody fly on Southwest, and you land in a Concourse C, right? Go to your phone. I want to get to the bus station. So you put that in, and here's what you, you'd be really surprised to find that from Concourse C to the Denver Airport Station, it's actually an 11-mile walk across restricted use of private roads, and it's got a one-mile drop, and then you've got to climb up another mile again, right? So to say that indoor navigation has a ways to go is kind of an understatement, right? Um, I'll go to the next slide. So we are uh, doing a lot of interesting things in this space as well. Um, specifically, probably the most interesting um, project we have is working with the Open Geospatial Consortium, uh, who is represented here as well today. And so o OGC is a most of you know who they are, I think. A lot of open standards are related to geospatial technologies. We have funded a pilot with them. Remember we talked about this future of pre-planning thing, all the things you can do with this data? Well, what if you, take this, you were to go from this 3D model that you captured and go to turn-by-turn -turn navigation, all right, just like we have outside? That's what we're trying to get to with this OGC pilot. It's called our Indoor Mapping and Navigation Pilot. So we are trying to go from these images and point clouds that we capture all the way down. You reduce this thing down to a network of um, sort of a, a network of nodes and connections here, just like you have on a street map, right? So that you could, in theory, uh, given a space, generate um, through some sort of indoor navigation service, generate turn-by-turn -turn instructions. The neat thing about the way we're doing this is that it's using an open standard, indoor GML, and the architecture here, I, I typically wouldn't throw up an architecture slide, but I know there's a bunch of um, savvy folks in here. If you recognize some of these terms, they're all open standards for data formats or interfaces, right? So we're doing this in a very open way. Uh, and at the end of this pilot, we hope to demonstrate that you can, in fact, go from these 3D point clouds um, all the way down to turn-by-turn -turn, uh, directions. I think that's all on that slide. You know, one thing that's interesting, I just want to point out about the navigation problem, is that it's very different. I mean, most of you, I think, uh, do in the outs a lot of the outside world, search and rescue. Um, you know, navigating indoors is very difficult, right? You don't have the same kind of restrictions that you have on roads. There's two-way flow, right? There's lots of different mobility modes. Um, you know, walk pedestrian, wheelchair, indoor vehicles, like in airports, for example. And um, you can go up and down through escalators, stairs, et cetera, et cetera. So, and it's a very different set of semantics. So reducing this down to a common language like indoor GML, we think is very important uh, for that problem. So that's really um, kind of a nuts and bolts of what we're, what we're doing and just some different ways of thinking about 
this indoor problem. A couple other points I leave you with is I know I focused on firefighters um, almost exclusively here, but we think there's a lot of uh, benefits for law enforcement in this space as well. You can imagine active violence. If you listen to any of those recordings of those unfortunate situations, uh, much of the communication, you know, say like 75% of it, a lot is about just conferring location. So if you kind of reduce that, 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 that need, uh, it opens up a lot of area, other areas uh, for communication, maybe with some other priorities, um, especially with the body cameras. And, then you, and, and this need for infrastructure free may be a little different for law enforcement. You show up at a school and you know where those Wi-Fi access points are and you can use those as part of your location solution, that could be really big. Um, I'd also encourage everybody to start thinking about 3D, right? Indoors is a 3D world, okay? Um, you really need to know, you know, if, if you have a 2D floor plan, you don't know what the ceiling's like, right? Where it is exactly, what it's made of. Um, whereas in this, if, if you start thinking about 3D, you get a much better sense of that. And then you, again, since you're, there's all these different mobility modes, 3D walking on your hands and knees versus just walking through the space. So everyone needs to start thinking about 3D. I think we're going to see a lot more um, from the traditional GIS products that focusing on 3D. Then a couple other things. Uh, we really, really value our first responder input into all these problems. So if you're interested in this space, please get a hold of me, jeb.benson at nist.gov. We have lots of opportunities to get involved, uh, including some real exciting ones that are going to take, kind of look at this technology space and ask the very fundamental question like, you know, what are we going to do with all this information, right? We have a grant opportunity. It's called iAxis. It's closed now. We're going through the award process. Um, you know, we're going to need a lot of stakeholder engagement in this space to kind of work with us to, we don't want to just deliver a bunch of technology and be like, all right, now what do we do with this? We want to start asking these questions now and having the discussions. How are we going to work in this indoor environment and how are we going to blend this outdoor to indoor space? Um, and then you can go, like the map where I showed all the different groups we're funding, things like that, all the different work we're doing, pscr.gov. Um, so I think that's it. It's a very exciting space. I know, again, a lot of you may not, may not think about the indoor space as much, um, but uh, it's time to start thinking about it. A lot of new technologies are going to make a big, um, big impact in the space. So that's all I've got for you.